welcome to a special bookmark on location. We're in Perilous Falls with its author, Raymond Arroyo. The book is The Lost Staff of Wonders, Will Wilder's second book. It's a sequel to the original one, The Relic of Perilous Falls, which published by Crown Young Readers, a division of Random House. Always great to Thank see you, you my friend, great Ray. Great to be back. Get you down here in our studios here yes. the, the, at the mothership. The mothership, Where it all indeed. began for you and, and for all of us here at EWTN, yeah. a mother angelica way, yeah. where the sign is out I on the street that now. I noticed It's in. a wonderful thing, yeah. which uh, your wonderful uh, biography has helped to enlighten so many people yeah. about mother's great work and her great mm -hmm. life and, great and her great witness uh, going forward and in the past, it, it's wonderful. Now, you you do so much for EWTN. Everybody sees you on the world over. We've got some of the great interviews you did, the conversations with Raymond Arroyo. Yeah. They're still airing. Get a lot of feedback about those yeah, as those well. But in, in between, uh, when you're not taking care of your family and everything else, you're spending time in Perilous Falls writing books. I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, just before we talk about the Lost Staff of Wonders, let's talk about how did the Relic of Perilous Falls do? What was the reaction to that? Well, it, it has been amazing. I mean, I've, I've gotten letters, I get them every week, from families, from teachers, librarians, and I've spoken to tens of thousands of kids over the last year, which is something, mm -hmm. you know, look, I deal with adults. I've written adult books. I talk to mm -hmm. adults all day. So to go into schools to talk to children, um, to watch them take this story to heart, when they read a story, they don't hold it at arm's length. They embrace it. They become it in mm -hmm. some ways. So to watch that process and to see the letters of families Families who've listened to the book together as an audio book or they've read it as a family chapter by chapter, that to me is exactly what I hoped to accomplish with this, to create an event and a conversation among families, because that's what the whole book is about. In going out a, a, over the years and speaking about the book and doing yep. book signings, was there anything about the book and the story that touched people in a way that surprised you? Uh, the, the Will Wilder books? Yeah, yeah. The thing that I think most surprise them. Mm -hmm. They love the antiquities. They love the relics. And the, 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 two, the two big pillars that I built this series on, one, all the relics and antiquities in all the books you can actually find in museums, mm -hmm. in history, but, but most of them you can actually see. Mm -hmm. In museums, libraries, churches, they're, they're discoverable. Mm -hmm. And when kids realize that, the lights really go on. They mm -hmm. love a scavenger hunt. They like things that might have supernatural powers or a supernatural connection, mm -hmm. and yet they're real and they have a deeper history. The other part of this, I have a protagonist in Will Wilder who is not an orphan. He hasn't been abandoned. He's not left alone with his friends to go on an adventure. He has an intact family. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not a perfect family, but right. uh, Nobody show is. me one that Nobody is. is. Right. Uh, right. But what I love about it is the whole family goes on the adventure together. And the letters I've gotten from families, um, and even people in broken families who say, you know, this really made me appreciate my grandfather father, or the uncle I now live with so much more. And our so family that was history. intentional that the extended family is so important here. Absolutely. I, my whole conceit in this series is if you don't know your past, if you don't understand the decisions of your grandparents and your parents and your mother and your father, you'll never really be able to embrace your future and see clearly enough to know your role in the in the history of that family. And Will Wilder makes that discovery. His great grandfather was an explorer, a collector of these relics. We don't quite know why, but as the books go on, he makes discoveries about his family and then about himself and his own gifts. And both books start with an episode of his life, right? Right. Jacob Wilder, who's oh. this kind of uh, um, he's got a supernatural gift too that he and Will Wilder share. Mm -hmm. This is his great grandfather. And each of those flashbacks at the top of the books, those are historically accurate. I spend a lot of time, maybe more time than I do in the rest of the book, fleshing out those setup pieces because I wanted them to be historically accurate. Mm -hmm. I wanted the items to be relatable. Now, I've taken some liberties, sure. but the place, the timing, some of the historical figures that cross paths with Jacob Wilder, mm -hmm. all of that is historically accurate. And those are the letters I get from kids. My gosh, is it, is it really true that, you know, in the new book, I've had early readers read it. Mm -hmm. In the new book, uh, Will Wilder's great-grandfather goes to Axum, he's, Ethiopia. He's in Ethiopia, right. Now, people go, why is he in Ethiopia? Well, for centuries, right. thousands of years, there's an order of monks there that have claimed to be descendants of the Queen of Sheba and that King Solomon brought the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia and they claim to still have it. Right. It's very mysterious. I've read a lot of books and reportage on it. Some of my friends have been there. I've seen pictures. There's a guardian, a single person who protects the Ark. Mm -hmm. No one is allowed beyond the curtains to the Ark 
and those that have gone close to it have suffered. So I worked mm -hmm. all of that in, and if we believe that, that the Ark of the Covenant might be there, well then it stands to reason that the staff of Aaron, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be inside the Ark, right. would also be present somewhere. Okay. So I put all of that in my brain box, I fictionalized it a little bit, and that becomes um, really the driver of the rest of this plot. Then we come to the present, mm -hmm. and Will has the staff of wonders, Moses' staff, under glass, and Aaron's staff in the museum at That's in the museum, Falls. Though, right. right. And it goes missing at the top of this and book. And he is the natural person for people to suspect because in the first book... He snatched a relic right. without permission. Right. And, uh, and he did it for his own selfish purposes. So naturally, he's suspect number one. And the staff goes missing. Everybody's looking for it. And uh, the plagues of the Old Testament start to unfold. Right, the ones along. we're familiar with, uh, obviously, yeah. having to do with uh, the plagues of Egypt, right? You Basically, got Basically, you can go through and... But, and I did a lot of research on the staff. I didn't, you know, because uh, I... Bath I, I, tubs I, versus rivers and right. Like where, that, where, right, where does the blood show up? How where did this happen? Where do the frogs come? All of this. Uh, and, right. we're, and, and there are only some of the, only a handful of the, the plagues that were used or f mm -hmm. came from the staff. There were others that God himself mm -hmm. executed. Moses had nothing to do with. God just did it himself. So I, I'm very attentive to that. So you really get a lesson mm -hmm. in not only Old Testament history, but you really get a sense of what this staff is. If you read the old Jewish literature, the Midrash, which I've read, mm -hmm. translations, I've been reading it in Hebrew, or Aramaic. Well, Father Mitchell is going to be very impressed oh, by know. what you just no, said he, there. Well, if you were reading it in the He's original, read it in all the original, the original languages. languages right, yeah, right. But um, th they claim that the staff of Moses is sapphire. It's a sapphire staff. And as I did other research, I realized, remember he went to his father-in-law Jethro's house mm -hmm. and he loves this girl, he wants to marry her, and, he's, and Jethro says, well, okay, go outside and see if you can pull this staff up. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one who can pull it up. Every other suitor like who tried to do it. Kind like the stone thing. Exactly right. right. This right. is the precursor to Excalibur. Right. You know, King Arthur pulling the sword from the stone, no one else could, and he's the chosen one. It is also the predicate literary, mm -hmm. in literature for magic wands. Mm -hmm. It all comes from the staff of Moses. So connecting with that great story that has informed so much of history, so much of the faith communities, mm -hmm. um, and tie it in a, in, a, in a contemporary context in an adventure I thought would be too much fun and um, I, I'm, you know, I sort of let that guide me and that became the ride that would become Will Wilder, uh, The Lost Staff of Wonders. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you as far as uh, this book, and, and thinking about this book and writing yeah. this kind of, the book's about 330 pages long or so. Mm -hmm. The other book is about 320 or something. Mm -hmm. They're both around the same. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a typical length for what you would call, what, a middle? Middle grade book. book. It's okay, a middle as opposed grade to book. a young adult fiction. Yeah, young adult fiction has become, um, really moved into what I would consider adult fiction. It deals with very adult issues, uh, cutting, and I won't get into it all, but right. very adult issues. Um, middle grade books tend to still stay in, this is, these are written for kids, and I would say the young at heart, mm -hmm. between eight and 12. Mm -hmm. Now my book, and the, one of the things I've loved about it is, I have older readers mm -hmm. reading this book, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60 year olds. They've bought it for kids or children in their lives, ended up reading it themselves. I have some adult readers mm -hmm. of the book. So it's written on two levels. There's an adventure in the foreground for the kids. There's also a lot of family subtext. There are historical allusions. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. beneath the surface that adults are picking up on. And I, as an author, I love that. And it was written that way. So it's a middle grade book. It's safe literature. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get into edgy, odd areas. It's fantastical, a little scary because kids love mm -hmm. monsters and frights. Right. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a coherent moral universe and it's the battle between good and evil played out in a spectacular dramatic What's interesting in, in reading about one of the uh, complaints they said about some of these books at times is that the covers are not representative of what actually happens in the book. In the book, book. that's true. Uh, that's not your case, though, no, right? No, no, these are, I know these are over the top covers, but right. look at your author. Right. Um, you know, a little over the top uh, is not a bad thing. Okay. You no, know, these are the dramatic moments, obviously, right. depicted on the book. The children, when I go into schools and they see these covers, they're like, wow, is this, oh. they have 20 questions, yeah. which is what I love. Right. I, I, you know, you want them be, to be drawn in, you want them to be excited, and we're in a very visual culture. Mm -hmm. Too often we give children books, and they're, you know, a title and some picture that somebody, looks like somebody drew in their, you know, mm -hmm. at, at nightfall or something, 
it's not exciting for them. Now, you, you, you don't have a lot of illustrations. We have about 12. Person. There's yeah. about 12 or 14. You don't want to overwhelm it because it's and, a balancing act. And, and how do those illustrations get done? Do, is that somebody reading it and coming up with it, or is that somebody sitting down with you and saying, what do you, what do you have in mind? They usually there? ask me, what are the dramatic high points that you think might lend themselves to mm -hmm. illustration? And you have to be careful because you have to spread them out. Mm -hmm. you, you know, now it's written, you know, there's a lot of action and episodic moments here, dramatic moments. But uh, I go through and try to locate those, and then the, uh, the illustrator comes back, Jeff Nenthrop, who did my cover and those illustrations. He's just, he's got a great eye. Mm -hmm. He sees, you know, his foregrounds are, are, mm -hmm. are beautifully drawn, and he just sees well. Okay. Um, so I tell him generally what we're looking at, the sections. He comes back with drawings. We look at them, and you see what you get. Have you made a lot of changes to them back Not and forth? Not really. A little bit. Of, yeah. I'll, make, I'll make a few or adjustments or, you know, uh, the, the, she's wearing a collar in that scene or he wears glasses okay. and can you make him a little taller and he has a crutch. Little things. But no, I don't change the illustration usually. Now, in the sense of the chapters and how long they are, what are they, about 10, 14, 15 pages? Do they have yeah. to be around that? And does each chapter have some sort of cliffhanger to it, in a sense? I try to build those in. Right. I mean, that's deliberate. Okay. I try to build a cliffhanger at the end of every chapter, and I try not to make chapters too long. Mm. Kids don't want to read long chapters and admit it. You don't either. Mm. I don't like to read long chapters. No. I like them, you know, I'd rather have more chapters than long ones. Um, and so that's what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I build uh, tight chapters. I cut back and forth between the action because, look, I'm attentive to uh, attention spans, mm -hmm. and you have to know that. This is why sometimes you'll give a child a book too early, mm -hmm. like Treasure Island, which remains one of my favorite books. Okay. I just read it with my, my sons and my little girl. Um, when you give them a book like that, because of the idiom and the world in which it was written, the pace is a bit slower. It mm -hmm. takes time to get into things. Kids don't have that patience. Mm -hmm. so. I don't take any of that for granted. I, I try to jump right in, and you keep the action rolling, and I keep a cliffhanger I try at the end of every chapter, mm -hmm. so they want to flip the pages. Right. And part of this, one thing I wanted to do was bring family together and get them to realize your history is as important as anything else in your life. And you, you owe it to your children to share that history with them. And the second thing was to mm -hmm. encourage and promote literacy. Mm -hmm. We have an illiteracy crisis in America and the world. Kids well, aren't reading what, as much as they So were. when you're writing for an audience of this age, do you have to be careful about what language you use and how you explain things? You do. And, and, I, and, I'm, and my editor is very conscious of that because right. sometimes I can start writing for adults and you have right, to watch right. it. So I strike a balance. Yeah. Um, sometimes we pair things back or I'll change, simplify some of the language. But the thing you're most attentive to is, is it holding their attention? Can you, are you keeping the balloon in the air? And do they want to flip? Do they want to keep moving through? Mm -hmm. And I've tried to also create characters that are exciting, fun, they're dramatic. They're instantly, when you read them, you know, Charles Dickens is you one can, of my you favorites. Can, you, you can see them, them, see them and you can hear them. Right, okay. You know, you see them, you have your own image of them. Right. And I love that kids have sort of embraced these characters. My villains are over the top, big villains. Uh, my, 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 you know, the characters around Will, his Aunt Lucille, Bartimaeus, who's a, you know, black man who works mm -hmm. in the museum with him. He has his own gifts. They, their characters are rich, and I wanted that. Children's literature should be as rich as any other literature. So I'm assuming you say that your characters are all based on a composite of people you've met throughout your they life, are. right? They are. Okay. Yeah, and Will, Will bears a few more traits probably of me than mm -hmm. any anybody else mm -hmm. um, he's a, he's a it, uh, ever since I was a little child I always had and it's interesting a little boy I was giving we had a book giveaway a few weeks ago and a little boy says I liked will because I I, I think I have the same gift he has mm -hmm. and I said well what's that and he said well sometimes I'll be sitting there and I see a shadow go by and I look and nothing's there mm -hmm. well I had that experience a lot I know a lot of people do you see mm -hmm. things in your periphery vision you look um, I also was very sensitive as a child, even now sometimes, when I walk into a place, mm -hmm. a new place, a, a club or a bar or, a, you know, an mm -hmm. a, a, a office, and, and I, I get a feeling I was going to ask you do, you, do you, do you, do you have a sense or a feeling that you have that level, that kind of discernment? Well, I, I uh, Or that yes. you felt like your a, ability to read a situation or see things that weren't gift. as obvious. Well, even in yeah. working in news, being able to see behind 
Well, you see what's a few being steps said ahead, and you know, know and what's going on. You, yeah, you see a little deeper. You don't oh. you don't let the you don't let the surface distract mm -hmm. you. Okay. And Will has a gift. Now his is not my gift, but he has a, he has a, a gift to see things, mm -hmm. supernatural things that the rest of us are denied. When you and Will argue, who wins? Will always wins. Oh, okay. You got to let the character win. The ca mm -hmm. I'm not the character, but that that little piece of him I get. Mm -hmm. I also understand the. Um, when you say something like that, some people go, well, are you out of your mind? What do you mm. mean you have, a, you have sensitivity? It's a feeling. Right. It's, a, it's a natural gift. With him, it's something else. It's mm. bigger. But you can relate to that. I can relate to his frustration, to his, um, his, his, his trepidation. He doesn't want to go face these things. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be cast and thrown into this battle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Sometimes this is, you, this is your this is what you were fashioned this is for. your destiny. This sense. is your gift. Right, yeah. And that's really what the book is about. And that's also what our Lord asks you to do, right? Well, that's exactly right. Is He's that if you're given these gifts, it's not to put them under a rock. That's right. right. You have to, to use them. And there's a cost them. to using them. Right. And you get that. There's also a cost of not using them. That's right. right. And you see that from the people around him, the older figures in the book, some of who have gifts of their own. You see the, the wounds they bear. Mm -hmm. And you also see the great good they've been able to do, not always easily, not without suffering. Mm -hmm. And that, th those eternal truths are also packed into this book, almost by osmosis. I don't even intend that, mm -hmm. but that kind of leeches out through the story. Who do you th see reading the book more? Boys, because the protagonist is a boy, as opposed yeah. to girls? Is that I thought what you that. tend to see? I, thought, I, I originally thought this is a book for... Uh, boys who are reluctant readers. I'm going to get them to really read and flip the pages. Mm -hmm. And I also, in the doing, created these great female protagonists, Aunt Lucille. Uh, mm -hmm. Will's Aunt Lucille is a 69-year-old dynamo. Mm -hmm. She has gifts of her own. She ends up being one of the major driving forces in the book. He's also got a best friend, Cammie, who's a really smart girl mm -hmm. who sees even further than Will does mm -hmm. on a natural level. She's right. just intuits things like most women, women do, do right, way yeah. before we do. Right. And girls have really taken to those characters. And I've realized, no matter you know, if it's a girl or a boy audience, they all take to the story for slightly different reasons, mm -hmm. but they're all enjoying it. So mm -hmm. I, for me, it works on both levels. Mm -hmm. You can't just have action. You know, I always take Rebecca to these action films, and of course, halfway through, she's, you know, she's dozing while I'm on the edge of my seat. Mm -hmm. And then she'll take me to one of these ro romance movies, and I'm dozing, and she's on the edge of her seat. The nice thing about this is it strikes both an emotional chord mm -hmm. and yet there's enough action to keep the boys interested. So it, it plays to both audiences. Mm -hmm. Now as far as, you know, when I was thinking about talking a little bit about the book and about the idea of writing and writing for this mm -hmm. age, age group, because I know you don't like to give too much of the story away well, anyway, but yeah. uh, one of the things as far as at least young adult fiction, which may not be exactly the same, yeah. is that it's about two-thirds of the, the authors are usually women mm. who are writing. Right. What about in, in, in the middle grade? Is it typical for men to be writing or is it more typical to see women Well, no, you've stories? got big male writers. You've got uh, Rick Reardon who did the Percy Jackson series. And, yeah, and Percy Ridley Jackson. Pearson. You got compared. One of them talked about Percy yeah. Jackson. And my first thing was, who's Percy Jackson? But then yeah. I remembered there was that movie. Right, Percy Jackson and the, and the um, Lightning Thief. Yeah, it has to do with uh, Greek mythology. He's and the Perseus, son of Zeus. Yeah, Perseus, He's the son of Perseus. Zeus. Right. Kids are drawn, Doug. Mm -hmm. And this is, my, this is my whole understanding. It might even answer your earlier question. Um, kids are drawn, as we all are, to the supernatural. Mm. We, we, we are drawn to it because we know, being spiritual beings, there's something in us that, that's natural, that wants to understand more than the things we see, touch, and feel, because we know, particularly at a young age, that th th that world is as real as this one. Percy Jackson, Harry Potter, those series played to that mm. sensibility. Mine does too. The difference is they used witchcraft, they used Greek mythology mm. as the centerpiece of their pieces. I use Western antiquities, the Old Testament relics, to drive my plots. Mm -hmm. It's the, 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 so the similarity is we're both dipping into supernatural waters. I would argue mine have real world implications mm -hmm. and you can actually go see, touch, and feel the things that are a part of this. So, so in your mind, at least, to people who might say, well, I don't like those Harry Potter books because yeah. of the magic thing, and I don't like the Greek mythology stuff yeah. because that's pagan, yeah. you know, okay. and uh, I want my kids to read good Catholic mm -hmm. books or Christian yeah. books yeah. and that, and I'm concerned about, you know, this staff, it's like a magic wand. Yeah. Raymond said that in the interview. Yeah. Uh, 
how is it different? What would you say to somebody well, who has concerns about that? I, I would say, uh, as I said earlier, it's not a magic wand. Mm. It is the inspiration that writers and and uh, you know people through culture took. Mm. They borrowed the staff of Moses. Like and hocus pocus it. comes right. from the mass. Comes right. Comes from the mass. Yes, right. They take things right. and they kind of you know distort Which them. Which is in typical time. of what. Well, it's what, Satan does ultimately. Well, yeah, and it's and it, and it and it has it's a certain mindset that wants to leech the divinity out of things. I try in this series, and again, mm. this is not a religious series. This is not an evangelical work, but there is a sensibility that is true to the the subject matter and the objects I'm talking about. Right. I mean, these are relics. These are sacred relics. Well, these are the great, remains of holy what's people. What's great which about I Catholicism is it's true. Of course. And since what this is reflecting of mm. is the truth, yeah. in a lot of ways. People who are Catholic can read those Catholic or Christian yeah. elements into that, right? Well, right. Different people are going to see the same work differently. It's like Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, why has he got these orcs and the mm -hmm. elves and he's got the, the and he's got the, the dark lord. Oh, it's it's so, so pagan. dark. It's yeah, for the it's wizards. Pagan, right. It's actually filled and suffused with mm -hmm. truths. Some of them Catholic truths, mm -hmm. others human truths, deep eternal truths. I tried to capture all of that in so this So do series. you see your approach as more Tolkien versus Lewis? Yes, much more Tolkien than well, the, the distinction being this. Tolkien used to jazz his friend or razz his friend um, C.S. Lewis because he thought Lewis's things were too on the nose. Mm -hmm. And they too were obvious clearly the obvious preachy evangelical right, works. Right, right. And while I love Narnia, it's beautifully written. Right. It is a bit, as, as time goes on, when you read it as an adult, I find you see it all a mile away and mm -hmm. it becomes sort of predictable. Um, I like the more veiled... Um, I like to let the audience make their own determination mm -hmm. so that, because I do believe people are not all good or all bad. People have choices to make. Mm -hmm. And if they choose to go this way, they can be brought back, but you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they don't want to be brought back, mm -hmm. in which case they have to be resisted. And Will learns that. The, in fact, this book is also, there's a lot of mystery in this book. Mm -hmm. Where is the staff? Who has it? Where is the demon? He can't see anything anymore in this book. He's having difficulty seeing what his mission is, what he's supposed to do. So there are multiple mission uh, mysteries mm -hmm. at play in this book that I like because Will is disoriented, as I think so many of us are. We don't. You can't always tell. Is this person my friend? What are they doing? What, what, what? And you you get a read on them, and it may not be accurate. And mm -hmm. even though his friends and his his mother and his aunt are telling him, look. Put your anger aside. Mm -hmm. in, in, this really becomes, I didn't intend this, yeah, but it becomes mm -hmm. a meditation on anger mm -hmm. at the end of the day and how it blinds us, how it distorts our view. Out of frustration, out of yeah. just well, not knowing? Or? I will tell you, I, uh, I'll tell you just how I got right. to it as a writer. I wrote, this, I wrote the whole story. I went back and I'm reading it and I, it, then the, the penny dropped. What was Moses' great sin? Mm -hmm. He allowed his anger, anger to flare. Where he killed the uh, Egyptian. Killed the Egyptian, right. uh, struck the rock with the staff. Mm -hmm. His frustration was always on the, and it's the reason he can't go to the Holy Land. He can't mm -hmm. enter the Holy Land. So I thought, wait a minute, how can I work this or elaborate this a bit because it was already in the story. Mm -hmm. So when I went back and looked, I realized, wow, Will is really fighting his own anger and frustration because he knows he's innocent. He wants to clear his name, right. but nobody's listening to him. Right. And, and, that there's, uh, and I know what that position is. Right. I mean, we've all been there. There's that where frustration. You, the frustration right. where you, you know, you're caught in a situation right. where you know, you know something no one else does, and you're trying to clear your name. That's hard. So I, some of that kind of channeled, I think, into Will. Um, but you realize, and he realizes, if you give way to that anger, mm -hmm. if you give way to that impulse, right. You not only will destroy right. others, you'll destroy yourself and your gift. And I think it's, as children, we've all had the experience where we got blamed for something that we felt right. we shouldn't have been blamed for. Correct. And no matter what you said, it didn't really matter because right. many times parents want quiet versus justice <laughs> and they're just trying to make <laughs> yes. it work, you know. That's right. And you're as a kid going, but I, but, 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 I didn't, but, but I didn't, I didn't. So it's very frustrating. Now, it's also, you've already got the audio version audio out. Audio book right? is so done. It's already out. Also, it's available through Audible, too. I saw that. It is. It's on that. Audible. You can get the audio yeah, book, book CD. CD. So many people, they uh, and I love this as a literary uh, mm -hmm. initiative. Parents have written me and said, we started reading it and we told the kids, you read five chapters and then you can listen to five on the audio book. Oh, so okay. it becomes an enticement. And right. I do all the voices. And right, it's, right, you know, right. it's, it's a performance. It's right. fun for me. Right. Which I'm sure you enjoy doing I too. I love doing it. Well, right. it's the voices I hear in my head. Right. When I write, 
I, I mean, I give, I'm talking quietly. I don't yell it to the So you're channeling your characters? Well, no, I'm acting the characters. Right. I'm in the characters. I, right. You know, there's a piece of you that, that's animating mm -hmm. these characters. And you, but you, start, you do start hearing mm -hmm. their voice in your head. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do because I was trained as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to, when the process is done, when you edit, when you cut everything down, to be able to perform it as a lot. So line. Will Wilder, the lost staff of Wonders, at the very end, somebody has a dream or a nightmare. Oh. Next episode is titled Max Merriweather. I can't reveal the next title okay. yet, but uh, but it is it's in the works. So about this um, time next year. About this time next year, maybe a little later, but um, okay. it it the series goes on and will goes on. A lot right. of well, congratulations. The book is just Thank out, you. and we wish you well, my friend. Thank and uh, as always, best to your family. The one and only Raymond Arroyo, his latest work, Will Wilder, The Lost Staff of Wonders, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Well worth the investment. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark. Thanks so much.